research and even another TED talk tells us 85% of you are about to be incredibly uncomfortable with my subject matter, disagreement and conflict. That's why my coaches tell me I have to smile and I have to make you laugh. <laughs> even if I don't make you laugh, here's the good news. Given what you do going forward with the three points, two stories, and one observation I want to lend you in the next 10 minutes, you never have to feel uncomfortable about conflict again. Interested? Struck by lightning twice, the small boat I was racing from Marblehead, Massachusetts to Halifax, Canada had no power. Engines gone, batteries are dead, which means the thousands of dollars of equipment we had to tell us where we were and where we were going are useless. On the nicest of days, we were in a place where you couldn't see land and there are no other boats around. This was not the nicest of days. All around us, the only light we have are lightning bolts, some of which going off so close you could actually hear the water sizzle when they struck. The winds are going at about 50 miles an hour which is a constant whistling sound. You can't hear. The crew and I are yelling at each other, trying to figure out what's going on. Most importantly, the waves are about twice as tall as I am and coming in three second intervals, which means the boat is moving, pitching. There's no place safe to stand, and I never had a grip like I had on that lifeline that night. It strikes me. Isn't this just what it's like? when you're in conflict with another person, all of this abundant energy that you can't put in any direction, not knowing where you are and where you're going, sound, yelling, screaming, not being sure where you're going. It's what it used to be like for me. I was one of the 85%, incredibly uncomfortable. I avoided conflict at all costs. Hi, I'm John. That's probably why I changed it into my profession. I'm over with that now. The question is, are you? Here's the big problem as I see it with conflict, how we handle it. Over and over and over again, we use the wrong tool. I'll call that tool the legal model. Sure, let's blame it on law and order and CSI, Perry Mason even, too much commitment to courtroom dramas, police TV shows. What does the legal model really say? It says, look into the past, figure out exactly what the truth is, and then dependent on what that truth is, somebody gets to punish somebody else. How useful is that, really? We ignore what people want. We ignore relationships. We ignore the future. Effectively, we sacrifice tomorrow to win yesterday. How useful is that with your boss or an employee or an irate customer? How useful is that with the parking enforcement officer from Charleston writing you a ticket? How useful is that with your child, your spouse? You know what happens if you use the legal model too often with your loved one, your spouse? You end up in the legal system getting divorced. I think I have a better way. It's exactly the opposite. We should be doing exactly the opposite. Use interests and intentions. Invest in relationships and focus on the future. Because the legal model isn't right all the time. Let me prove that to you. You know that in hospitals, when doctors make bad mistakes, and you've heard that a couple of times today, sometimes doctors make bad mistakes, 2% of those end up in court. In the corporate setting, where plenty of bad behavior happens, the worst things end up in court 3% of the time. The legal model is right 1%, 2%, 3% of the time, but we use it over and over and over again for the 90% of conflicts that we face every single day. I think we should be doing what I was talking about. Let me introduce you to my friend Jim Tull. 
Jim and I went to college together. Shortly after that, Jim goes to work for Habitat for Humanity. He heads off to South America. Very shortly after he got there, Jim was abducted by rebels, dragged deep into the jungle. It took Jim a few hours to realize, you know what? There's no helicopter flying in with Marines rappelling out of the side, getting us out of here. There's no banker showing up with a bag of money to help pay me out of here. And there isn't even a diplomat with a briefcase who's going to come in and do this negotiation for me. I have to do it myself. When I met with Jim a couple of months ago and said I was going to do this talk and these were the three things I wanted to introduce, he said that, that's what I did. I'm going to give you those three things and you don't even have to be abducted. <laughs> three waypoints. Use interests and intentions. Jim immediately began to think, what am I interested in? Freedom was paramount among those. And what is my intention? How do I intend to get from where I am to where I want to be? But importantly, he didn't stop there. He also thought about what do they want? My captors, what are they interested in? What are their intentions? And he began to talk about that with them. Could you do that tomorrow with that boss or that employee? Could you slow them down for a minute when they start going off and simply say, hey, wait, what is it you're really interested in? What are you intending to have happen? Invest in relationship. Relationship itself is valuable. Jim, a native speaker of English, immediately began to use the most polite Spanish that he could muster. He began to talk to the people who were holding him hostage as people. He began to talk to them respectfully. Let's say you leave here after this afternoon and you go out to your car and you find one of Charleston's finest parking enforcement officers writing you the ticket on that little computer thing. How are you going to start that interaction? Are you going to run up on them and go, hey, what are you doing? Respect? What about starting by right? speaking to that person as a person rather than a defendant on the stand? It's not the legal model. Talk to them. Build the relationship. Focus on the future. Jim chose strictly to use language about tomorrow. He chose to talk only about what was possible. He did not raise things that he had heard, things he had read in the newspaper about atrocities that the rebels were accused of. He spoke strictly about what could be. When you go into the bathroom next time and you find the cap off the toothpaste, which you have talked about a million times with your significant other, can you swing your focus to the future? Can you think about a day when the cap will go on rather than thinking about what is the punishment for this activity? These are the three rules that gained Jim his freedom. If he had used the legal model, there's a really good chance Jim would be dead instead of who he is today, one of the world's finest trainers of negotiation. I believe we are never going to be able to embrace chaos until we can handle our own everyday disagreements, until we find a way to shrink those things that feed and seed the giant issues which are the things we deal with every single day. Here's the good news. You're probably going to get a chance today. Before you close your eyes to sleep tonight, you're probably going to get a chance to do this. Please, try it. Try these three simple ideas. You know another storm is coming. They happen every single day, right? The question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to let all that useless energy, the lightning bolts, the waves, the wind, knock you off of where you want to be? Or are you going to use that moment to raise your own awareness of the opportunity, the possibility of the benefit that's inside that conflict? Can you Simply try this, because if you do, you will live a better life 
tomorrow. You may not get everything you want. You may not get out of the ticket. You may not get the toothpaste cap back on. But you will live a better life, and so will everyone you interact with. So here's the question. Where do you want to be? In that night storm or under a velvet sky with a million possibilities, with three simple rules, three stars to provide you with a new direction forward? That's my hope for you. Thank you.